Competition time. For the month of March, I'm giving away one free BKF hoodie that you can see on BrianKingFitness.com at the end of every Monday episode for the month of March. So to enter, all I want you to do is head over to iTunes or Stitcher or to wherever you listen to the podcast and leave an honest review and give it a star rating. And I'm gonna pick one winner every Monday after the Monday show, and I will announce it on my Instagram, on my Snapchat, on my Facebook. So to enter, all you gotta do, leave an honest review, rate the show, and I'm gonna pick a winner every Monday after each episode. So enjoy today's episode, and I'll catch the winner on the other side. You're listening to the Brian Keane Fitness Podcast, where Irish fitness entrepreneur Brian Keane answers your questions and interviews leaders in the world of fitness, health, mindset, and natural wellness. To share tips about all things that can support you on your journey to becoming the best version of yourself and build a bulletproof mindset to get whatever you want out of life, come join the fun. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Brian Keen Fitness Podcast. We talk everything fitness, nutrition, and mindset to help you with your goals. Today's episode is going to be a Q&A, and I've pulled the questions from my Instagram and Snapchat. So if you're not following me on those platforms, particularly Instagram, spending a lot of time on there at the minute on Instagram Lives, on stories, and in DMs replying to people. Um, so a massive thank you to everybody who sent in the questions. And um, we've got a bit of a range today um, as the Q&As tend to have. So I hope you enjoy and get a load of value from it. So first question comes in from Skelly Skiers on Snapchat. I want to lose body fat. Should I go on a keto diet? Um, so I'm going to answer this one from a couple of different angles because to lose body fat, it can be as simple as getting into a calorie deficit and doing a good training program that is focused on either a combination or choosing to do resistance training that tears fibers down and elevates your metabolism so you burn more calories throughout the day or a cardio-based program where you're elevating your heart rate and you're burning more calories during that workout, both of which can put you into a deficit. My personal preference is doing all three, where you go into a deficit with your nutritional plan, eating good quality foods, keep your energy levels high, then you keep your resistance training in there to elevate your metabolism, and then you have your cardio, particularly HIIT cardio, that is not gonna take that much of your time, but also gets your heart rate up to allow you to burn more calories during the workout. In terms of a keto diet then, I have a little bit of a pet peeve with keto diet, intermittent fasting, and these other nutritional strategies to lose body fat. Now, in isolation, they're amazing. Um, Intermittent fasting is another one I get asked quite a lot on, which is where you go long periods of the day fasting. And I think for health and for a certain demographic of the population, I think it can work really, really well. Same as a keto diet. I think if you are an endurance athlete or someone who is committed to going keto full time and staying in a ketogenic state, which I'll explain more of now in a minute, I think it can work really, really well for people. The only issue I have with it is it can sometimes be pushed as the next quick fix on this is how you're going to lose body fat. And I do see it in certain magazines, the ones that make my brain bleed that it's like, well, keto is the next way to lose body fat, or it's just the next version on from a bar diet or a juice diet or Atkins or South Beach diet or whatever those other fucking stupid diets that don't work long term for people. That's my issue with keto and the way that it's framed. And um, as a diet, it can work amazingly well for people. And as a nutritional strategy, it can work incredibly well for people. As a quick fix to lose body fat, there's a lot easier ways to lose body fat than going into a keto diet. So for those of you that don't know, a keto diet is effectively just when your body switches over from using glucose as its primary fuel source, so carbohydrates that you eat, and starts using ketones instead. It's kind of like the analogy I like to give is petrol or diesel for a car, that you can run your car off petrol or diesel. The only difference is with ketones is they're basically nearly an unlimited energy source for your body. So that's why they work so well for people like endurance athletes, marathon runners, triathletes that are doing long distance endurance because you're allowing your body to run off ketones, which doesn't really run out. It's kind of like running your car or your your van or whatever it is that you're driving and you never run out of fuel. And as great as that sounds, it's not that easy to get into a keto state and it's not, it's even harder to hold your body in a keto state because so many things can knock you out of ketosis. And there's a great book, I've forgotten the author's name, but I'll try and link it in the show notes on the website, brankeyfitness.com, called Keto Clarity, 
which breaks down a lot of the misconceptions that people have when they're trying to go into ketosis. And um, one of those being that you can eat a super high protein diet and still go into ketosis. To go into keto and to get your body to switch over from using glucose, you normally have to cut your carbohydrates back very, very far or, or keep them very, very low. It depends relative to each person. But for a lot of the population, it's between zero and 50 grams of carbohydrate. You also have to drop a lot your protein back because you can, your body is able to convert the protein or excess protein that you eat, particularly in the absence of carbohydrate, it's able to convert that into glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis. It's where you don't have enough carbohydrate in your body or you've got a massive excess of protein. Your body will try and use glucose as this form of energy, so it'll convert that protein. So eating too much protein can knock you out of ketosis or stop you getting into ketosis. So your diet normally comes from 80% or more fats. So different healthy fats, coconut oil, olive oil, avocados, but that's your primary diet. You're eating mostly fatty foods. And the issue with that, and I've gone keto a couple of times, is when you get into ketosis, you feel incredible. Um, I have to admit personally, when you're actually in ketosis and you feel that transfer over, you, your brain is super clear, you feel really steady energy throughout the day, your sleep in my case was better, but it was so difficult getting into ketosis. And again, it varies on the time period. Some people drop in sooner than others. Some people will take things like exogenous ketones, which is where you take a supplement form that can help you get into ketosis faster. They are relatively new, so I can't even offer an opinion or perspective on their long-term effects on the body because your body's not really designed to take exogenous ketones and drop into ketosis, even though evolutionary, that's the reason we can do it when we cut our carbohydrates and protein back because evolutionary, the warrior diet, the even before Paleolithic, the theory was that we would intermittent fast throughout the day, hunter-gatherers would go out and hunt, and then they'd eat a small or a big meal over a short period of time. And then as a result, they were fasting and their body was running off ketones the rest of the time. So that's kind of to give a little bit of a background on where it came from the fitness side and where it's in terms of the warrior diet. Ori Hoffmeckler is on the podcast later this month, who was the pioneer of intermittent fasting um, and is big on a ketogenic diet within intermittent fasting. So definitely stay tuned for that episode. But in terms of dropping into ketosis, it is horrible for the few days before you go into ketosis. I remember two, three days, every time before I would drop into keto, into, into ketosis, I would feel like a zombie. I couldn't concentrate. My energy levels were crap. My training sessions were so subpar just because my body was trying to make that transfer over. And then you drop into ketosis and it was very easy to knock yourself out. You have too much protein in a meal, you'll knock yourself out of ketosis. You have a couple of drinks at the weekend, you knock yourself out of ketosis in most cases. And that is where I struggle with the push on a keto diet as a method for people to lose body fat because a ketogenic diet is an amazing thing to do probably for your health, particularly for endurance athletes because of the unlimited energy you'll get or for people that have made the decision that, look, I don't need drinks at the weekend, I actually don't need to eat that much protein, um, I don't need to eat chocolate or my free meal or cheat meal or whatever label you put on it, and you've made the transition into, I'm going keto and that's it. For those people, by all means, it can work tremendously well, but that's a lifestyle change as opposed to losing body fat. When someone wants to lose body fat, there's so many other easier ways to do it. So in terms of my opinion on a keto diet, I think it's an amazing way for people to live. And I will probably experiment with it in the next upcoming months after Marathon de Sabla and see how my body responds for six, eight weeks in keto. But that would be down to me wanting to do a half Ironman before the end of the year and different other endurance goals that I have. That is purely my reason for it. And I'm able in a fortunate position that I can make that lifestyle switch if I wanted to. But to lose body fat, 
it's so much easier to do it other ways in my opinion you drop into a calorie deficit with your nutritional plan you keep in your good complex carbohydrates and your high quality protein foods you get your recovery from your workouts you do your resistance training where you're tearing fibers down and elevating your metabolism so that you're burning more calories throughout the day and you increase your cardio either low intensity steady state cardio where you're using fat as your primary fuel source or high intensity interval training where you're doing sprint based training hit cardio and you're using glucose and you're elevating your heart rate to burn more calories during the workout all of those things are so much more sustainable for the majority of people to lose body fat what i would advise if you are considering dropping into ketosis or doing a keto diet is hit your fat loss goals first and then experiment with going into keto because that is probably going to serve you more than actually going into keto just to lose body fat because by all means it will work it's just going to be so much harder and more difficult and may not be as sustainable long term so they're the kind of questions that i would ask um in terms of losing body fat to go into keto i don't think it's optimal um but by all means i'm a big fan of ketogenic diets i think they work tremendously well so find what works best for you just in my opinion it's not the best way to lose body fat okay next question comes in from kevin mac 89 how can i be more productive in the morning so I know a lot of you follow me on Instagram stories um, and I get up pretty early. I get up at 5 a.m. every day um, just because it is a time that allows me to take that hour in the morning to set myself up for the rest of the day. Um, it's funny because I'm going to offer a couple of things here that will hopefully help people with productivity in the morning, help people that aren't morning people by nature. I'm not a morning person by nature. Um, I very much had to convert because I would stay up all night and then I would sleep in through the day. That is my kind of general, if I was left to my own devices and didn't have to hack it in order to be more productive during the day and get more done and prioritize the things that are important to me, that's what I would naturally go to. Um, and I, I still take ages to wake up in the morning. Even when I get up at 5 a.m., it still takes me about half an hour just to either to normally come round. But in terms of productivity in the morning, what I would advise is first you have to understand what productivity means to you and what it is that you're trying to achieve. One of the reasons, and I've spoke about this in a couple of seminars that I speak spoke at over the last year, 18 months, that a couple of things that have changed my life trajectory more than anything else is one of two things is a combination it's actually a combination of these two things one is getting up earlier and the other was reading and consuming more books particularly audiobooks for me because it's my preferred method of learning even though i read physical books as well but the getting up earlier was something that i really struggled with reading books was a lot easier i live by the thought process of just turn your car into a library on wheels if you're driving two hours a day an hour to an hour from work or half an hour to and a half an hour from work that's an hour or two hours of an audiobook you can consume or a podcast you can consume. I think they're very, very similar. If you listen to podcasts, normally audiobooks are a good way to consume information because it's a method you're already familiar with and you're probably more of an audio learner than you realize because the people that tend to gravitate towards podcasts, I'm one of those people. I've been listening to podcasts for nearly 15 years since they first started. Um, it's just that they've blown up in the last two, three years because I'm an audio learner, I just didn't realize it. And then when audiobooks came out, it gave me a new lease of life. I'd read probably seven books until I was age 25. And now I read two or three books a week, depending on different variations of either audio, Kindle or physical books. And being more productive in the morning has changed my life over the last couple of years, getting up that extra hour, because it sets me up for the day. And normally what I do, and it's something that I advise people experiment with, because everything is an opinion and a perspective at this moment in time, but this experiment served me and it's something that I've kept and doubled down on, is the first hour of your day normally sets you up for the rest of the day. And again, I can't speak for everyone else, but what I have found through a little bit more self-awareness on my part over the last 12, 18 months was, when I get up a little bit later, when I say later, I used to always get up at 6 or 7 a.m. Because I used to work as a teacher, I used to have to commute, and that was my kind of time to wake up. But when I get up at those times, I feel like I'm always chasing the day. Because I never had time to just kind of pull myself back and literally frame my day. Think about what I'm doing, or even consume an audiobook or podcast, which I'm going to talk about now, that sets me and frames my day and what's most important for me that day. Or what's most important in my life at that moment in time in terms of personal goals that I'm trying to achieve. And 
when I got up a little bit later, I felt like I was rushing around all day and you're in this state of anxiety. I used to have this terrible bad habit of rolling out of bed when my alarm would go off and I'd go straight onto Facebook, I'd go straight onto Instagram, or I'd go straight onto whatever social media platform I was into at that time. And what that does is it sends you into an automatic reactive state and then you're, the rest of the day, all you're doing is reacting to things. And it took me a while to hack that system because I didn't realize I was doing it because I was getting up in the morning, it was sending me into that because when you go onto social media and you're liking, you're commenting, you're sharing, you're doing all these things at 6 a.m., you're literally priming your brain to go into that reactive state and then everything that day is all reactive. If you take that first hour of the day, I literally don't go on social media until 6 a.m. I don't I have a full hour, five to six a.m. where I'm consuming an audiobook or a podcast, normally something that is in alignment with my particular goals at that moment in time that's going to set me up for the day. For me right now, it's always a business podcast of some sort um, or something to do with stock market or real estate or investing. The area of my life that I'm prioritizing right now to expand my own knowledge in because it's the thing that interests me. For 10 years before that it was fitness it was always nutrition it was always training it was always something that supported that goal that I would spend my free time doing whereas now it's changed because my priorities have changed but what I do advise is whatever it is that you're trying to do this is one of the reasons that I bring out my podcast every Monday and now it'll go every Friday with the guests and my GA podcast is going to be on a Wednesday and we put it out early in the morning so people can consume it first thing if they decide and what that does is it sets you up for the day and I've had people message me, particularly on some of my podcast episodes, that I've got very, very um, expressive on topics when I start talking about things that I'm passionate about. And people will message me and go, I'm so fired up for the morning. If you've ever listened to my podcast or anyone else's podcast or audiobook or whatever it is and felt that feeling after, that set up your entire day. Because I bet you had a fucking awesome day then because you're framing yourself for what's important and you're setting up your mindset for the entire day. So when I get up in the morning, I literally frame my brain for what's important for me that day. So it allows me to take that time for myself. Normally, there's not too many other people up at 5 a.m. So you can take that hour. You can just have a think. You can relax. I either do my recovery strategy for my GA program or right now I'm normally driving to the gym um, just for the month before the Marathon de Sable because of the way my training split is. And I'll consume a podcast or the audio book that's supporting me most at that moment in time. And that's my first hour of the day. And then at 6 a.m. And a lot of you will have re received replies from me on Instagram at that time because that's when I check my DMs on Instagram. That's when I check my Snapchat. That's when I check my different emails that are sent to me because it allows me to set myself up and then I can serve and help people because I'm already in that mindset. So what I would advise and I would offer to experiment with is whatever productivity looks like for you, take that first hour in the morning, regardless of what that time is for you. That's your time and whatever it is that's, most important to you at that moment in time, consume something that's going to support that end goal. I've spoken in the podcast regularly in the past that you can't hit a target you can't see. And whatever it is that you're trying to work towards, and that might be your body composition, that might be trying to lose body fat, that might be trying to improve your performance, that might be trying to build muscle, you might be trying to leave your job, you might be trying to find a better boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or someone you can spend your life with. It's relative. Whatever is the most important thing to you right now, setting yourself up on that first hour of the day on some form of content or information or reading or audiobook or YouTube clip or whatever it is, is going to help frame you for the rest of the day. And that can allow you to be more pro productive because of the compound effect over time. Compound effect is like a snowball. You roll a sm small sm snowball off a hill. And by the time it reaches the bottom of the hill, it's this massive snowball. And that's compound effect. That's doing the right things day after day. Tell me what you do every day and I'll tell you where you'll be in 10 years. That is effectively creating the right habits. I spoke about that in my book, The Fitness Mindset that doing the right things every day and creating the right habits. It takes 66 days to form a new habit from the studies from the University of London. Doing the right things and setting yourself up, taking that hour every morning and consuming a piece of information around whatever your biggest goal is or whatever it is in life you're trying to achieve right now. You do that every single day, Monday to Friday for a month, for two months, for six months, for a year. My God, the transformation in your life can be unbelievable. And I'm speaking anecdotally as somebody that's done that. And that was what I would advise in terms of being more productive in the morning. So hopefully 
Kevin and anyone else that is wondering about that, hopefully that provides value to you um, because productivity means different things to different people. But in this context, I've read it as a, how can I set myself up to achieve whatever is the most important thing in my life right now and allow me to do that consistently over time so I can hit the goals that I'm trying to hit. Okay, next question comes in from Pat Mulkey. How does ZMA work and does it help with sleep? So ZMA is actually one of my favorite sleep supplements that I recommend to people. And again, it varies and I'm going to give a little bit more context on who this may support as a supplement more so than others. In the supplement section of my book, Fitness Mindset, I have zinc and magnesium as two options in there. And the ZMA stands for zinc is Z, M is magnesium, and the A is, is meant for vitamin B6, it's the, the chemical compound, it's why they've got the A in there. And the two supplements that I've recommended in there are alongside um, GABA in small doses and melatonin for the people that are traveling across tr cr um, time zones. The reasons I've included those supplements is because they're ones that people tend to be deficient in. And the way that they help is ZMA can help you drop into deeper restorative sleep and help you drop into REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. I spoke in the book about the 90 minute cycles of REM cycles. So you go into 90 minute rapid eye movement sleep cycles. Um, and one of the tips that I've offered that a lot of people have fed back to me with and this changed my life in terms of not waking up as groggy was waking up after a 90 minute rim cycle. So waking up after six hours or seven and a half hours or nine hours so that you're not halfway through a rim cycle, which basically just means you wake up super groggy if you're halfway through a rim cycle. But what ZMA can do is it can drop you into that rim cycle sleep and drop you into a deeper sleep, which the more deeper your sleep is and the higher quality your sleep is, the more you can recover. The more natural testosterone you'll raise or the more natural growth hormone you'll raise, the better you'll recover from your workouts, which means you can train a higher output the following day and you get compound effect kicking in doing that consistently over time, means you'll have more energy, means you'll have better workouts, means you won't have um, issues with cravings as bad as some people and you won't have the willpower rolling out just from having a lack of sleep. There's a great book by Kelly McGonigal called The Willpower Instinct where they talk about the studies on people that have been sleep deprived and how their willpower runs out as the day goes on. Um, and I'm walking example of this. If I haven't slept well the night before, I find it very, very difficult to say no to the chocolate bars in the evening or you know the biscuits or whatever it is that I'm craving at lunchtime. Um, also, the most recent studies on sleep have showed a lot of people being slightly more insulin resistant when they haven't slept well even the night before, which basically means that you're going to crave sugary foods more so the next day. And what ZMA can do is it can drop you into that deep sleep so you don't have those issues. What happens with zinc is it's a precursor for testosterone. So precursor meaning that zinc allows your body to produce more testosterone and testosterone isn't bad for females either it's for both genders it's just the balance is different it's normally higher in guys and lower in females but girls also need a balance of it it's going to support strength it's going to support lean muscle it's going to support your hormones in general a balance with estrogen and what zinc does is it allows your body to work as a precursor for testosterone so when you train and high functioning athletes or people that go to the gym or train a lot in particularly high intensity sports um, or doing intense workouts, you tend to get deficient in zinc. It tends to be one of the first minerals that your body depletes and gets deficient of if you're a high end athlete or you're following a high intensity training program. So this is one of the reasons that supplementing in the back end can not only support your recovery, can not only support your immune system because zinc is vital for immune function, it can also help drop you into a deeper sleep. It's not so much that adding in the ZMA will help with your sleep. If you add ZMA to a normal person that doesn't train, doesn't have a good diet, it won't do anything. Like most supplements, it won't do anything. But if you're training, there's a good chance you're deficient in zinc. So by hedging your bets and making sure you're putting it back into your body, you're going to allow yourself to drop into a deeper sleep. You're going to support your immune system so you don't get sick and you're just going to feel better overall because your testosterone will be at its optimal level provided that everything else in your nutrition and your diet is good. Magnesium, on the other hand, then works in a slightly different way. Magnesium can relax your central nervous system 
And because of all the different things in our environment right now, the processed foods that we eat, sugar as well, every molecule of or every molecule of sugar you eat or every gram of sugar you eat is going to put a molecule of magnesium out of your body. So all these things can have a negative effect on magnesium. It's one of the reasons why people have like chronic anxiety provided, but especially if it's not environmental, anxiety comes in loads of different shapes and sizes and different things can trigger it. But with a lot of people, sometimes it can come down from nutritional anxiety, from a lack of magnesium in the diet. And when you supplement it back in a small amount of it, it disappears nearly overnight. Um, incredible with some people that I've worked with that have great lives from their own admission, but they just feel a little bit edgy. Um, but they're coming off the back of a really crappy diet or a processed food diet. And then we change them over to good quality whole foods and adding in a magnesium supplement. And nearly overnight, I'm not even being dramatic with that, they feel that their mood is so much better um, because of the power of magnesium. So that is one of the reasons that it can help you sleep as well. For both reasons, you're kind of hedging your bets in the fact that one, it's winding down your central nervous system. And the more wound up your central nervous system is, your and particularly your, your sympathetic nervous system, the harder you're going to find it to fall asleep. So it can help relax you. And it can also support your mood in general so that you're not feeling edgy and anxious and all up in your head which can also negatively affect your sleep so that's why it's another favorite of mine in terms of adding it in before sleep so in terms of that's how it works and does it help with sleep if you're deficient in those minerals yes 100 it will if you're not probably not the same as most supplements supplements should always supplement what you're missing in your nutrition. If you're eating, you know, high quality magnesium foods, loads of raw cacao, you're eating loads of zinc, good quality red meat and steak, you may not get the same benefit from ZMA as somebody who's not getting those foods in their diet or those ingredients in, or those minerals in their diet. So it's like most things. If you're deficient, definitely worth considering adding it in. If you're someone that has poor sleep quality, again, it's worth considering adding in. Um, but if you are eating a diet that has those minerals, zinc and magnesium particularly, you're probably not going to get the same benefit. So again, like most supplements, it varies person to person. Um, so I'm a massive fan, particularly in isolation. I take both those supplements by themselves, but most brands have it combined. Um, so I recommend experimenting with, them, experimenting with it. They're not that expensive if you think you need them. Um, but again, always take the recommended dose. Don't go crazy with any vitamin or mineral because any excess can cause damage to people. So just be aware of that as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely worth considering. And I'm normally a big fan for a lot of people who are particularly deficient. Okay, next question. How do you not lose muscle when training for a marathon? So this is one that I can answer a lot on right now because I know some of you are following my Instagram and I am training for and only a month away from the Marathon de Sabla, which is a 256 kilometer run through the Sahara Desert in Morocco. It's effectively six back-to-back -back marathons, even though there's an ultra marathon of 100 kilometers in the middle of it. And at the minute, that's what I'm training for. So a lot of you following me, there's less gym work, even though I'm doing a little bit of minimal effective dose, which I'll speak on now for hypertrophy to keep my size. But I've been doing a lot more running. And I'm going to split this answer into two parts, one very short, and then I'm going to expand. To build muscle and train for a marathon is very difficult. It's basically the old adage and one of my favorite Confucius quotes that if you try and catch two rabbits, you'll catch neither. And that's how building muscle and training for a marathon is. If you're trying to get jacked and add a lot of muscle and you're trying to train for a marathon, you're either going to not hit one of those targets or you're going to be subpar at both. However, maintaining muscle and training for a marathon is not that difficult. That's actually very easy to do because that is just a manipulation in nutrition, making sure you're getting enough amino acids to repair and keep the muscle you have in combination with a minimum effective dose of hypertrophy so that you're stimulating fibers tearing down so that you're not losing any size. So to build muscle and train for a marathon, that's difficult. To maintain muscle and not lose it and train for a marathon, that's significantly easier. So I'll use myself because I'm probably my own best example in this case, even though I've trained people for marathons, particularly half marathons. I've got more people that come through my online program that do half marathons but and maintain muscle. It's down to 
a nutritional combination of enough calories combined with high enough amino acids from protein. So keeping your calories high, because when you start training for a marathon and you're running, I run average 50 to 100 kilometers a week, sometimes more, sometimes slightly less, depending on the training week and how I've scheduled it. But I'm burning so many calories. My metabolism right now is like throwing paper on a fire. So I can I eat 200 grams of white chocolate nearly every day, which is nearly 1,100 calories on top of all my meals because my metabolism is just burning all through, is burning every single thing up. But I'm keeping my protein high. It's actually a little bit higher than normal. It's in around that 300 gram mark because I'm trying to maintain the muscle that I have. So even though my calories are increased, my protein is also increased from that. And then I'm playing around with fats and carbohydrates depending on whether I'm trying to go fat adapted or carb adapted that day or that week, depending on finding out what will work best for my body in the desert. And what I have found is once you're doing that minimum effective dose of hypertrophy, which is your uh, body power training, eight to 10 reps, three to four sets, 60 to 90 second rest, it's just the parameters you're working in. It's your quote unquote bodybuilding parameters that can build your body. Once you're doing a minimum effective dose on that, so I'll go in and do eight to 12 sets of a body part, normally a push pull leg split. Um, sometimes a little bit of shoulders and arms as well, just because my arms tend to get a little bit smaller. And like once I get any stimulation in them, they hold and they don't drop off at all and I never lose any size in them. But the minimum effective dose on that in combination with enough calories and enough protein can allow you to maintain a lot of your muscle even though you're doing marathon training. So my goal at the start of my preparation for Marathon de Sobola, which began at the end of August of last year, I actually had planned to lose a few kilos of muscle because I thought it would help me and support me more through the desert. I actually haven't. Um, and through no conscious effort, apart from the fact that I haven't given up my resistance training, hypertrophy training, and I've kept my calories high, my body's maintained it. And in my experience with the people that I've worked with in my online programs, particularly when going up the half marathon distance, provided your calories are high enough and your protein's high enough and you're stimulating your muscle to not atrophy and get smaller, you're going to be able to maintain a lot of your size. So that is what I would do if you want to train for a marathon and hold your size. But on the flip side of it is if you're looking to build muscle and also do a marathon, be aware that that's going to be significantly more difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible because nothing is impossible but it's gonna be significantly more difficult. We'll probably need a lot more experimentation with different foods and supplements and timings and training regimens. Um, but to maintain your muscle and not lose it and train for a marathon, that's 100% doable and is actually not that difficult once you have the proper plan in place. Okay, next question comes in from csavage9 on Snapchat. Is a gym or a barbell and dumbbells at home better when you're starting off first? So, this one really depends on reverse engineering your personality type for preference because the truth is you can get probably the same results doing both. It very much comes down to the program you're following. So I have a lot of my GA players on my GA Lean Body program that train from home because you can do nearly everything in that. There's different variations of that workout. There's so many different variations of that program. But the ones that are training at home can do everything with a box, a bench and a dumbbell and barbells. Regardless of whether you do that at home or whether you do that in the gym, it doesn't really matter because 20 kilos is 20 kilos regardless of where you lift it. It's about the program you're following, the parameters you're in, the tempo you're using, and then obviously refueling with your nutrition and refueling with your recovery and refueling with your sleep. That's what's going to impact your results and how quickly your body responds. Whether you do that in the gym then or do that at home very much comes down to reverse engineering your personality type. And I'm going to flesh this one out just for anyone listening that is either starting off at the beginner stage or is considering switching from a gym to home or home to the gym and is wondering, is it going to make a difference? And this goes for whether you're a, a female looking to lose body fat and tone up or a guy looking to get jacked and improve performance and everywhere in between, because it doesn't matter where the environment is in terms of the actual structure of how your body will respond. As I said, 20 kilos is 20 kilos, regardless of where you move it or lift it. But the actual psychological effects of being in one and the other can be very, very different depending on your personality type. So what I would advise is reverse engineering what works best for you. Lifestyle wise, it's going to make a lot more sense if you've got three kids at home and you've only got 20 minutes to do a hit workout with some dumbbells and barbells. 
probably going to make way more sense for you to do your workout at home with those pieces of equipment than driving 20 minutes to the gym, doing a 20, 30 minute workout and then driving 20 minutes home. However, you may have someone else that when they get into the gym, they switch on and you have a bit of a Pavlovian response. Pavlov dog is the psychological studies on when you, they would ring a bell and a dog, they would feed Pavlov's dogs, actual physical dogs. And after a certain point of doing this over and over again, they would ring the bell, give them food, ring the bell, give them food, ring the bell, give them food. And then they started to remove the food. But when they'd ring the bell, the dogs would start to salivate. And they it's a very, very well-researched psychological tendency that we call Pavlov's response that when you walk into a gym, and we've all done this, we all have a song or we've all have an environment or a gym where we just it just switches and turns us on to whatever it is that we're trying to do. And I have a Pavlovian response when I walk into a gym because you're bought, you're used to going in there and crushing your workouts. And as soon as you walk through the door, it's as if someone flicks a switch and you're like, okay, workout mode now, time to train. Where some people can't get that Pavlovian response at home, they get in the gym. But finding what it is that's working best for you is gonna be very, very important because you can get that response in both, both sides. Some people will train at home and don't find the distraction of having to queue for equipment or people looking at them or they feel slightly self-conscious for whatever reason and they can get their workout done at home and keep the intensity high. That person's gonna be way better off doing dumbbells and barbells at home. The person that finds that being around other people, particularly if you're a little bit more extroverted in personality type, being around other people, particularly if they're not distracting you in your workout, just being in a gym with other people that are training hard can support you training harder. So that personality type is going to benefit more from the gym. So starting off, it doesn't really matter. What you may find is if you're feeling self-conscious about not doing things correctly, you may want to start doing those movement patterns that are in your program at home first and then translate it over to the gym and then see what works best for you. So the truth is there is no right or wrong answer. A gym isn't necessarily better than training at home and a home isn't necessarily better than training at the gym. I do a combination of both. I've got a gym at home but my personal preference is always going to a physical gym because when I see people training hard, it allows me to switch my mindset to train harder. And I live by the adage that you should be the hardest worker in the room. So if I see people crushing their workout, it always lifts my level. Probably a little bit from my sporting background and just my personality type, having grown up and played sports all my life, when I see somebody else training super hard, it allows me to move my level higher. So my personality type lends to training in a gym. Yours may not. So have a little bit of um, thinking on what may work best for you and realize that it actually doesn't matter which one you do, you're going to respond well, depending as long as your program and your nutrition is good, regardless of whether you're training at home or training in the gym, regardless of whether you're starting off now or you've been training for 10 years. Okay, next question comes in from Anonymous. I couldn't get it up the first time I tried having sex with a girl I really liked. I was so nervous. Is that normal? Okay, so I wanted to answer this question because it came in on one of my Snapchat Q&As and I got so many messages from different guys after I answered this question because I'm very aware that as guys, particularly Ireland, and I have a pretty big following in the UK also, um, and I spent four years in London, so we're very, very similar in terms of personality types, Irish and English people, in terms of our humor, in terms of our closed offness on the things we talk about. And this is a situation that tends to come up over and over again with different guys in different ways, but we never fucking talk about it. So first thing I'm going to talk to you on the fact that when you are about to hook up with a girl, and normally it's in one of the case of either when it's your first time or it's a super hot girl that you're really attracted to, what can happen is your body floods with the stress hormone cortisol, which puts your body into a massive state of fight or flight. And through evolution and evolutionary biology, your body is designed to, in stressful situations, to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. That's effectively what happens it's the thing that kept you alive thousands of years ago. Evolutionary psychology suggests that the people that had this flight response passed on those genes. And as a re reflection, everybody that has that response now, it's just a 
biological trigger that we have from thousands of years ago and it's been passed on gene after gene after gene so that's why your body goes into that fight or flight response and that's effectively what happens when you hook up with a girl that you're either super interested in and don't want to mess up with or you find really really attractive your body sends this flood of cortisol and you can freeze so all your blood that needed to go towards your nether regions is going elsewhere in your body it's circulating elsewhere and particularly sometimes it goes up into your head and then you're overthinking it what happens with a lot of guys and it's funny because this tends to happen amongst younger guys in the early 20s in college because what happens with older guys that are in their 28 29 30 31 we've all experienced it at some stage in our life and we realize that we end up drawing different reference points from that experience that the first time we hooked up with our girlfriend who we thought was super hot uh, we were so nervous, we couldn't get it up and we couldn't figure out you know, what was going on and then we ended up having the next six years together and that never became a problem again because you get your hedonic adaptation where your body and your brain and everything, your physiology gets used to being with that person and you become more relaxed. You go into your fight or flight and you've got rest and digest which is your also your rest, digest and reproduce. That is when your body's not feeling stressed. And that's what happens with a lot of older guys is they're able to draw on the reference point of the first time they hooked up with their girlfriend and they realize that, oh shit, okay, this happens and it's nothing to do with you in terms of there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you physically. It's normally just a flood of cortisol that's going through your body and sending you into that fight or flight. So realizing that the first time it happens, and it can be a little bit embarrassing, particularly if it's a girl that you really wanted to hook up with and you're probably not going to see her again, but it's something that happens. But on the bright side of that is we get, and this is very, very well studied and proven in different psychological circles of, it's called exposure therapy, that when you're afraid of something and you expose yourself to it regularly, it makes you less fearful. That people talk about it with snakes and frogs and spiders, where you expose them to it. And then every time that like, they freak out the first time and go crazy, their fight or flight response is in overdrive. And then every time they do it consistently, it gets less and less and less and less. That's what happens with the hot chicks. Happens the first time, there's a little better the next time, and then before you know it, three or four girls in, it's just normal, and you don't feel it anymore, you don't feel that stress, and your body doesn't respond by you not being able to perform. The same thing is with your girlfriend. When you've been going out with someone for, or are going out in three, four dates, and then it's time to hook up, and you're not able, you know, three, four, five more dates, when you get more comfortable, it, it ends up never being a problem again. So realize that, it is normal in the case that any time your body sins goes into fight or flight, it's an evolutionary adaption that you have that probably kept your ancestors alive thousands of years ago and now it's just fucking you up in the bedroom. But it's just something that's going to happen with your body from a physiological point of view. When you can get out of your own head or when you can calm yourself down or when you expose yourself to it more or you see that person more and you put less stress on the situation, it goes away and it fixes itself and the only difference between guys that are a little bit older and have had that experience is they're able to draw on the reference point. So the reason I'm sharing it and probably the reason I got so many messages after was as someone that's older, I've experienced it. Most of my friends have experienced it and the ones that haven't just fucking haven't said because they probably experienced it as well at some stage. And when we don't talk about these things, it can make us think that we're the only one. And it's funny because... When I wrote the anxiety section of my book, which was on the bestseller list for countless months, the anxiety section of the book, I got so many messages back from people going, I never thought somebody that was quote unquote externally successful would ever have those issues. And I spoke about how I was externally successful, but internally tormented. And it's funny because when we have an issue and I spoke about my anxiety for the very first time before that book came out, you think you're the only one. You think it's just you and think you that has the problem, but there's hundreds and thousands and it's probably millions of people that have had or have had or have the same problem as you. It's just we don't speak about it. So this is another one of those that it's not an issue. It's just a biological thing that happens to guys when there's too much stress and cortisol flooding your system, but it goes and it's not a problem unless it's obviously something genetic and it's happening consistently over time. Even when you're not feeling stressed, then by all means, go to a doctor, get it checked out. But in 99 and probably 900, you know, 999 out of a thousand times, it's just too much cortisol flooding through your body. So be aware there's nothing wrong with you. If it's a girl you like, 
and you're going to see her again, that's going to get significantly better. If it was just a hot chick that you hooked up with that night, then the next hot chick will be better and it'll be even better the next one after that and the next one after that. So hopefully that helps. Um, and I know I've got a little bit of a different audience on the podcast, so hopefully you got value from this as well. Um, and be sure if you're, you've got mates that you want to tell and share the podcast with, just send them a DM or hit them up and tell them to check it out um, and hopefully it will help. So that's everything from today's podcast. So for more information on me or my programs, head over to briankeyfitness.com. My book, The Fitness Mindset, is available on Amazon, the book depository, and all jewelry bookstores in Ireland. My Snapchat is briankey019. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube is all Brian Fitness, And my other podcast, the GA Lean Body Podcast for any GA players, be sure to head over and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, everything GA on there. So massive thank you for all your questions. Thanks for listening. Catch you all next week.